All right, so then let's continue with a kind of different topic. Uh, from time to time, I'll touch on to other lectures, of course. Uh, one of them is uh, InfoVis. Um, so the problem which we have with mobile and which is something we need to address specifically when we want to visualize information is that we have a very high information density. So the physical size of the screen is usually pretty small, but we have maybe full HD resolution. Um, so we could put a lot of information on there, but not in a way that the user is easily able to comprehend it. Um, so uh, that's what, why we need to look into InfoVis at least a little bit with a mobile focus. And I'd like to uh, show you some examples which maybe you've already seen in the lecture. I think it's a, it's a, it's a bachelor's course, uh, InfoVis. Or, so uh, who, who took that course, the InfoVis course? Okay. It's part of visualization, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, so five people. So just a very brief overview. One uh, very common technique for which you can have a lot of different implementations is called focus and context. And um, so that you have an overview and a detail view at the same time. One example would be uh, just from Google Maps, for example, that you have this, uh, this context view which shows you about where in the world your current view is and then you have the focus view down here, um, the big one. If you do it the other way around, that's often called a lens. You can have different implementations here. So you have the big view giving you the context and you have the, the small inset view, the lens giving you the uh, focus view. And there are some different ways of how to, uh, how to blend between the, uh, the focus and the context, just overlay it or make it really look like it's, a, it's viewed through a lens or maybe blend it. So um, it kind of depends on the usage context, which one is best, but uh, all of these are basically just different implementations of the same basic idea, which is to provide a detailed view and an overview at the same time. So you don't have to switch between them. Um, you might already have seen this. It's part of, of the current exercise, Halo and Wedge. Um, so these are simply ways of visualizing exactly that. Uh, so I have, for example, different search, uh, uh, different, uh, different locations of interest with which I have searched for, as you can see by what this is running on. This is actually quite, quite old by now, but it's still uh, sort of valid. Um, and by looking at those circles, you can basically just get an impression of how far off the screen the different uh, objects which are on the map are. Um, quite similar with Wedge, um, for, the, for the exercise, it's up to you which one you want to implement. I think Halo is a little easier, so that's, that's fine if you want to go with that one. Um, but here again, we have sort of a focus and context view. The focus is the map itself, and the context is the, um, the screen border with these different circles. So here I'm, I can, can estimate that the thing I'm looking for is maybe actually somewhere here. Uh, for this one, it's probably already here, so it's pretty close to the, to the uh, border of the map. Um, but that's again just one possible implementation of, of focus and context. Um, Okay, so that was just a brief detour into info, InfoVis. Um, any additional questions up to this point regarding visualization? Um, now then I'd like to talk a bit about visual input. So how can I get data into the mobile device by using vision, yeah, vision in the widest sense. And for that, usually I need a camera. There's two different uh, major classes of camera available. There, there are CCD cameras and there are CMOS cameras. Um, most mobile devices use CMOS cameras. Um, 
because they're simply cheaper and they're um, more or less sufficient for most mobile applications. The one major difference is that they don't have a so-called global shutter. That means if I have a CCD camera, the more expensive ones that are used for, I don't know, for astronomy or in industrial applications, um, or also uh, usually in high-end uh, digital cameras, then all pixels, when I take a picture, all pixels will have uh, their information collected at the same time um, and for the same duration. And when I have the cheaper CMOS cameras, which are used in mobile phones, then it will, uh, uh, the pixels will collect their information line by line from the top down. And Usually that's not such a big problem, but as you can see in this picture, if you uh, take pictures of moving objects, then they will get quite distorted. You can try that quite easily at home if you have a, have a fan, a ceiling fan or a standing fan, then you can just take a picture of that one with your phone and you will get a, a very similar effect. Also, if you uh, take a picture, for example, uh, from inside a moving, a moving car and take a picture of something on the side of the road, then everything will skew to the side because the pixels on top will get, uh, will get their image basically taken earlier than the ones on the bottom. So that's the, the major difference between the two, um, the two camera classes. Um, one other important thing to keep in mind, uh, which both of them have in common, is that they're again basically just grayscale sensors. And if you want color, then you need to put on uh, such a so-called buyer pattern over the pixels. So for each four pixels, you get two green filters, one red filter and one blue filter. And um, two green filters because the human eye is more sensitive to green. Um, a little bit off topic, but, but does anyone have an idea why our eyes are more sensitive to green? Yeah, any? Going back to the roots, which I think no. that it I think the explanation is actually going, going it's, it has to do something with evolution and I think it's just because we uh, evolved in an environment of, of plants, green plants, which are important for food and that's why the human eye is more sensitive to them. So, uh, and for that very reason, um, you, you can detect uh, differences in green color better than other colors. And so this pattern uh, uses, um, yeah, uses more green filters. What's important to keep in mind here is that the, um, the color information usually on such a camera sensor is only half of what the grayscale information is. So uh, you get, so in, in this example, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, get eight by eight pixels. Of, uh, of an image, basically, but the color information is really just four by four pixels. It's interpolated between the different uh, pixels, so it doesn't look like that in the, in the final image, but um, due to the filter, the, uh, the actual color data has less resolution than the uh, grayscale data. All right, so now let's talk about how can you actually use that to put data into the device. The simplest version maybe is to use something like a barcode. Um, so you, in, in reality, you usually run across two different variants of barcodes. Um, the first ones are the linear ones, which you can find on, on every, basically every product which you can buy in a store, which contain around 11 digits um, and which can be used to look up uh, global code for that specific product and which is used by the store to tell you how much it costs and so on. Um, and uh, a little more complex, then we have QR codes, which are these ones, the 
you've probably all seen and used them already. They can get quite complex. You can put up to about three kilobytes into such a QR code. You can also have varying levels of error correction so uh, that you can still read it when it gets dirty or damaged. Um, and of course that would again then reduce how much data you can put into there, but they're actually quite, uh, quite versatile. And there's usually a ready-made app to scan those um, barcodes. What's important, especially on Android, is that you can integrate that app into your own app uh, as a sort of module, so to just, uh, you don't have to implement all that functionality on your own if you, if you need it. Um, another way of putting data into the mobile device would be optical character recognition. One really um, neat uh, application of that would be to live translate, uh, for example, signs. So this example works very well. So here you have something in Kyrillic, and then you take a picture of that with your mobile phone, and you get simply a translated version of that sign uh, and know, know what it says. Um, so this is, of course, not that easy. This is actually quite complex problem in computer vision. So here we have uh, a very clear, bold font uh, with high contrast and so on. So that's not that difficult to actually extract from the image. Uh, when, once you get something like uh, uh, more complex scripts, for example, I think Arabic might be more difficult or um, Chinese, Japanese, which you can write in tons of different uh, configurations, then it might probably get a little more uh, difficult to actually extract useful data from that. Plus, on top, you usually need, of course, some kind of translation engine. So this is also, again, an example when you need some kind of trade-off. Um, you can't put all of the character recognition and uh, translation stuff on a single mobile device, so you will probably need to outsource part of it to some, to some cloud service. Um, I think Google has, has an app which does exactly that, uh, and so, of course, it uses the, the Google backend in some way, uh, and at the same time probably collects, uh, collects your data so Google can improve their, their services. So again, privacy versus, uh, versus cloud issues here. Um, yes, please. Um, well, I think it's, again, it's a, a bit of a trade-off. Um, it's probably split uh, so that you do the actual character recognition on the device and the translation on a server, for example, because you couldn't have uh, for, I don't know how many different common languages are there, 20 worldwide maybe or 30, and you couldn't have like 30 different translation databases on your phone, I guess. I guess that would just take up too much space. And for that reason, um, the translation will probably be handled on the server, and the, uh, the character recognition will probably be handled on the device because it, then it will work in real time. So um, that would be my idea of how to split that. But of course, depending on what, what app you use, it might have a different approach. Um, yeah, so in a way, this is actually already augmented reality because it takes a picture of the real world and uh, puts computer-generated information on top of that, which is, which is aligned to some place in the real world, in the picture of the real world. So here the computer generated information is of course simply the translation, um, but it's, uh, it's aligned to the ori original sign, so for that reason it's more or less already augmented reality. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about an even more complex way of using camera data as input. Um, 
this is a whole group of algorithms which are called SLAM. Maybe they've all also been mentioned in the VR class briefly. So um, this stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. So that means I take a series of pictures of my environment while I move. And from the relation between different points in those pictures, I can build up at, uh, in the one uh, place, I can build up a map of my environment with different uh, 3D points and so on. And I can also tell where I am in that, that environment relative to all the, the pictures I've already taken. Um, and there's two major scenarios which this has been used for uh, on mobile devices. The one is, of course, um, called inside out. I'm moving within a real environment. I'm creating a map at the same time, and I'm uh, I know where my device is. And this is basically what we would need for um, completely mobile virtual reality. Because then I would also need to know, oh, there's a desk over there and would need to put up, put up some warning sign maybe uh, so that I don't walk into that desk when I'm moving around. Um, all of this uh, would be required for, for yeah, mobile VR. Um, and this is really an active research topic, but right now the cameras and the processing power in, mo in modern smartphones is just about sufficient to, to do that properly in real time. Uh, but uh, then of course you would still need to do the virtual reality rendering on top, so it's still not quite at the point where you can, can already use that out of the box. So it's still ongoing research here. The other approach, which you can actually get commercial apps for, which work pretty well, this is some sort of outside in tracking, so a bit of the opposite. There you have one fixed object and you move your smartphone around it and use that data to create a 3D model. So the map is basically of one single object and the, mo the motion of the device around it is just to, um, to map that object um, so you get, yeah, uh, not a 3D model of the environment, but of one single, one single thing. And because that has a lot uh, smaller scope, basically, uh, this is something which you can actually already do on a mobile device um, for a whole room with, uh, which has, of course, uh, orders of magnitude more uh, 3D points, this is still yeah, too, too computation, computationally uh, uh, expensive. <clears throat> okay, so um, any questions up to here regarding visual input in general? Um, then I'd like to briefly show you a few other examples which kind of combine these different, uh, diff different interaction methods. Uh, this one is called Touch Projector. This is uh, uh, a research project which sort of intends to make interaction with a public screen uh, easily possible. So for example, you walk by a, a, a store window and there's an interactive screen, but it's behind glass, so you can't use touch. And the idea here is that you then start to, uh, to look at the screen through your mobile device, and then you can interact with the image of the big screen on your mobile device by uh, using touch and moving things around, interacting with content and so on. Um, does anybody have an idea how this uh, is implemented? So what kind of, of uh, technique which we just discussed will this probably use um, of the ones shown earlier? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. website and then basically what you're doing on the, uh, on the website is like projected on, on the screen. Mm -hmm. Well, in a, I, th I think in this example, um, they actually didn't have that initial step of setting up a, uh, things with a barcode, which would of course be a good idea. Um, I think they simply had 
everything on the same Wi-Fi already. So that was kind of cheating. Um, but uh, I think the, the main implementation aspect here is, as you can see, these images have a thick white border. And the, uh, that's actually quite easy to detect in terms of computer vision. So the, on the phone, um, it will simply detect those white borders. And when you touch on the video image then within one of those borders, then it will uh, send the uh, touch data to the, uh, to the public display. And that will then move the, um, the image accordingly, for example. So yes, please. Here, yeah. So, um, of course, yeah, that's a good point. So um, just to, I think you can see it here, for example, or, or even here that the, the thumb is basically covering the entire image. So it would actually be very difficult to, to zoom in into one of the pictures. So that's, that's a good point, of course. What would work in this example up to a point is that you could get closer to the screen because then you would get a bigger view of that single picture. So that might work, but uh, of course it's, it's a drawback. Um, other comments? Um, 